NWP Radio. You're listening to NWP Radio, a production of the National Writing Project. NWP. All right, everybody. Love to the National Writing Project family, the teachers of English that are watching, students, parents, families, and everyone else who is viewing this episode of The Right Time. I'm Brian Ripley Crandall, director of the Connecticut Writing Project, and it is an absolute pleasure to co-host this series with Tanya Baker, director of National Writing Project programs, national programs. The Right Time is our response to all who love writing and the books that inspire young writers we teach. Tanya, it's so wonderful to see you again. How are things out west? Hi, Brian. Uh, you know, you probably know that California is one of the five hotspot states, mm-hmm. so we continue to be cautious and a little nervous and wonder what's going to happen for teachers and kids, especially as yeah. everyone in the nation is doing. But in all of this craziness, I get to spend one day a week talking to you and great authors and teachers, and it's that's a highlight of my week always, so I'm glad to see you. We're so happy with this new series, a sp- special collaboration with Penguin Random House in celebration of children and young adult, children's and young adult literature. Last year, I asked Brian, how can we celebrate the upcoming 50th birthday of the National Writing Project? And with Brian's usual energy and zest, he said, let's invite 50 writers to come along with us. And I said, that's crazy. But I never should doubt Brian and his energy because that's exactly what we're doing. The National Writing Project is thrilled this week to welcome Aaron Stewart and Esther Theater to the right time. Hello to both of you. Hello. Um, Hi, welcome to the show. Erin Stewart grew up in Virginia and she now makes her home in the shadow of the Rocky Mountains with her husband and their three children. Erin loves using her background in journalism to research and write fiction based on real life. A heart failure survivor and an adoptive mother, she believes life throws plot twists and people into our path for a reason always. I love that. (laughs) Scars Like Wings, which we will discuss tonight, is her debut novel. Welcome, Erin. Thank you. Good to be here. Oh, good to have you, Erin. And it is my pleasure to introduce Esther Theodore, who's a colleague of mine in Connecticut. Um, Welcome to the program, The Right Time, Esther. Thank you. Several years ago, um, Esther stopped by my office, and I knew she had that special something about her because she started pulling a lot of the young adult literature books off of my shelf. She's a voracious reader and she teaches with equal passion. Esther is an EL teacher at Stanford High School in Connecticut. Um, She is the EL student. She's also an EL student herself who migrated from Haiti when she was nine years old. Mm -hmm. Um, Esther is currently finishing her master's in TESOL at Fairfield University. She's a member of Alpha Sigma Nu and a former participant of the Connecticut Writing Project. Esther believes every individual carries with them a story that enriches the educational journey, stretching it beyond the classroom. And I could just tell you that having Esther in my world with her global vision and her passion for immigrant and refugee youth is one of the, my favorite things about her. Thank you. Oh, so kind. One of my favorite things about your writing project in general. What a lovely group of people. <laughs> Esther, uh, I'd love to turn it over to you. Why don't you give us a writing prompt to kick things off? All right, so let's get started. Um, So in the novel, Gabriel, better known as the hippie dippy tattoo guy, refers to Ava as a walking piece of badass art. Um, I would like for us to write about um, a scar that we have, either internal or external, that is simply badass, that tells something about us that is um, amazing. So let's do that now. Okay, three minutes, everyone. I'm getting the timer started.
about 30 seconds. Wow. get to a place to, to stop. And if you're watching the show, you're welcome to pause us and, and keep on writing. Um, yeah. Do you know what made this prompt interesting to me this time is that I love that you referenced Gabriel and the idea of a badass piece of art. Like it changed, it totally changed the way that I narrated the same old story I always tell. Cause I was like, I'm not a badass. <laughs> <laughs> Tanya. That's very true. Very true about like the way the, the scars are viewed differently, right? Which is mm -hmm. part of the work that we read. So Tanya, you were going to say something? Uh, Brian asked me. I, I also had the similar experience. I wrote about a scar I got when I was a kid, um, when I got hit with a swing set between the nose, so or between the eyes, so I have a big scar right in my nose. But I have not really thought about it as badass before. And not quite Harry Potter scar, but yeah. I never thought about it before. <laughs> No, that, that's, that, is, that is a great writing prompt. I thank you for that. So I'm yeah. going to hand the show over to the two of you. We, we're going to stand aside and let you talk to each other. Awesome. Well, thank you. Enjoy. Erin, do you have a badass scar? I do. Well, so the one I wrote about, and I'm glad that Brian said that about the word badass because that's very purposeful in using that term because the whole point, well, one of the points of this book is to rewrite the narrative on what scars are and how we feel about them and the shame or the embarrassment and to turn them more into something that's kind of awesome and like shows what we've been through and not only what we've been through but what we've survived right because if you have a scar it means you survived so right. that means right there you've got a story so what i wrote about actually when you read my bot when they read my bio i'm a heart failure survivor yeah. um which basically means my heart gave out when I was like 25 and I'm recovered now, but my heart has a lot of scar tissue because of that, because it actually like got bigger and changed physically. So my heart has scar tissue and because of that, it doesn't work properly all the time. So I take medicine all the time and it's something that's kind of, you know, on my mind a lot because it's a scary thing. But um, I think what I wrote about is how I'm proud of those scars now. And they're nothing that anyone can see, right? No one's going to look mm -hmm. at me and see my heart scars. They're internal in that way. Um, but I'm, I'm proud of them. I do think of them as badass scars because I survived heart failure and I, I actually got it from pregnancy and my child lived and I survived that. And so I just so many things about that, um, about my story about surviving heart failure remind me and really, I put into this book because I wanted to change that narrative and make, make them badass scars. <laughs> something we don't have to be ashamed of, but something we can be like, look what I've been through and I was stronger than the thing that tried to kill me. How awesome am I? So. You are, you are. And you did a great <laughs> job in changing the narrative for sure. So my badass scar is um, from the age of eight, I got burned. Um, my scars are mostly hidden. The one, the the ones that are least attractive are mostly hidden, but everything else looks like birthmarks on my legs. Oh, okay. But I, I got burned and I, so I could relate as I'm reading the book. I'm like, oh my goodness, yeah. I remember that step. I remember <laughs> part of the recovery. I remember this. So um, definitely um, personal there for me in reading and crying and going through the yeah. journey. I have to ask you, like, how did you come about telling the story? Like, well, how did this begin? Yeah, so I'm not a burn survivor, so I'll just say that right off the bat, because people often want to know, do I, am I a burn survivor? I'm not. Um, but about 10 years ago, I guess it's been more than 10 years now, I met a little boy from Romania named Marius, and he actually was adopted by a friend's family after his, his parents died in a house fire in Romania. So they brought him over for treatment at Shriners Hospital, and my friend's family adopted him. Um, and I met him, and he had been severely burned by this fire that killed his parents. Um, so, um, burned a lot like my main character, Ava, in the book. Very severe. Um, didn't, almost didn't survive. And when I met Marius, like, more than 10 years ago, he was 8 years old. And I expected to meet kind of a broken little boy, like a, a victim. That's what I expected. That's what I had in my head, right, when I met this burn survivor. 
But instead I met this 10 year old boy that was so full of life that just had this belief that he was so much more than his scars and he just didn't care. Like it was like he was going to live his best life and be his best self. And that stuck with me. Um, and it was a story idea in the back of my head for years and years and years. And I actually started writing it at one point and it just wasn't going. The story just wasn't there. And I stopped and I wrote something else. Um, and then I came back to the story years later and um, Marius actually worked with me a lot to help me get the story and the characters where they needed to be. Um, but that idea of just overcoming that, but not only overcoming, but having this belief that you are so much more than your skin and your scars, I, I wanted to tell a story about that. So that's where it came from, just Marius. And I talk a lot, a lot about Marius and on my website, I talk about him and you can find him on the internet and he's amazing. He's 20 now and he's still just doing his thing and living his best life. And yeah, he's, he's, he's amazing. So yeah, he was the one that inspired the book for sure. I caught a glimpse of, of his story and yes, he's very confident, very outgoing and just quite handsome. I like the hair also. So oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> Nicely done. Um, so we have to talk about things in context, right? In fact, nowadays there's, there's, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement. Mm -hmm. There's where a lot of the racial issues that are being unveiled, you know, in our society, um, big, big issues for us um, as educators that we have to not only teach, but address in the classroom. How do you, how would you tie your book to what's going on in society right now? Oh, that's a great question. And there's so much going on in society right now, right? But I really think of like everything that's going on, I think comes down to two things. And I think there are things that Scars Like Wings speaks to. And the first thing is empathy. Black Lives Matter, wearing a mask, all these things to me come down to empathy. Putting yourself in someone else's shoes and trying to understand and connect with what they're going through instead of just what you're going through. Um, and that's you know all throughout Scars Like Wings. It's all about seeing the world and seeing someone's experience from a different angle. And Ava, the main character who's burned, has to do that with other people and other people have to do that with Ava. Um, so my hope would be that someone would read Scars Like Wings and leave this book feeling like they want to be a more empathetic human being and they want to walk in someone else's shoes and really understand someone else's pain. Uh, that's what I would hope. And then the second thing, um, is this concept of people heal other people mm. and that's a big theme in scars like wings is that we need each other to survive and it's funny because at the beginning of covid and everyone was kind of united and it was like we're in this together and it was like this big thing and now it's like so divided and it's like masks or no masks and school or no school and everyone's got their opinion and if you don't have their opinion you're a total idiot and i just feel like what happened like we started out so beautiful yes. <laughs> so right right yeah so and then like we were like teachers are the greatest we should pay them a million dollars and now we're like send them in without masks okay you know like i just it's so weird that we change so quickly and so in stars like wings a big point probably the thing that is the most is the closest to my heart is this idea of people heal people and we need each other and if we don't band together and pull together as a unified humanity we're in trouble and and i think we're seeing that that we're in trouble um so those are the two things, empathy and, and pulling together as human beings. So that those And the people. healing, the healing process goes throughout the book with all the characters. You know, every yes. single character, I want to say, has a story of healing, whether it is the scars from the being burned or losing a child or um, dealing with friendships that have changed um, because of events in life. So you're very right in saying that, you know, as, as humans, I think that part of the process now too is understanding that we're all dealing with something, right? Yes. We all have something that we need to grow from, we need to heal from, we're, we're hurting with, and having that empathy and allowing each other to heal and uh, being there for one another. Yeah. Um, very big part of your book and, and very true for us. I have to say, I love, 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 love how you helped the aunt heal by providing the opportunity to be a parent to someone else's child mm -hmm. that goes through the same tragedy. I, I, I know that we need people and there's several ways that you could have told that, but to 
put the characters together in such a way that they have to deal with each other, right? She still is now sacrificing for someone else's child and still dealing with the grief of losing her child. And a lot of parents are burying their kids, whether with COVID or whether with other illnesses. What, what made you do that? Like, how did you come to that point to tell the story like that? So I knew, I knew I wanted Cora to have lost her own daughter so that they were kind of the replacements in each other's life and mm -hmm. they resented each other, but loved each other. I knew I wanted that complicated relationship. And that's one of the things I worked on a lot in revision was Cora, was her mm -hmm. character and their relationship. And I, um, my first drafts, she was kind of there and kind of stereotypical. But yeah, I really fleshed her out to make her this evolving character as well. And like you said, I worked really hard to make sure every character because I think books that have a theme, it's so much stronger when each character is going through, is learning that same theme through the book. So every character is healing from something, internal, external, they're healing. Um, and it was really important to me to have that. And if you look at each character, every character is healing from their trauma in a different way. So Aunt Cora is trying to fix Ava, right? She's trying to like make it okay and everything's fine and it's you're going to be great. I'm going to fix you. So that's her solution. And then Piper, um, Ava's best, who becomes Ava's best friend, she's trying to get over her trauma by running from it, right? Just pushing everyone away, shutting everyone out and saying, I'm fine. No one can get to me, right? And then Ava is withdrawing into herself, saying the world's better off without me. So we've got all these people trying to overcome their traumas in different ways. And what they all learn is what we're talking about is that their ways are ineffective. Cora re realizes she can't fix Ava's scars, right? Our scars don't go away. Your scars are there for life, right? They're, they're there. So you can't fix each other's scars. The only thing you can do is be stronger together and lean on each other and be there for each other. And that's what every character by the end realizes is that they, they can't fix each other, but they can be stronger together. Um, and that was, that was the message that I was really hoping. And it, and it didn't start out that way in my first drafts. You know, it kind of evolved as I was writing the story and I realized myself, oh, that's what this story is about. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, and then I realized that is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> so. And that was actually my next question. Like the characters do, do evolve. I know in the writing process that that does happen. Is there any, any character that you, that surprised you? Like how it turned out like versus what you had initially thought they would be? Oh. Did, like anything changed like you talk about Cora Cora starting one yeah. way and now realizing that you needed to craft her to tell yeah. the story of not being able to change scars is there anyone else that you're like you had to write in that you're like you didn't have the plan of writing them in or any surprises in character uh, so Cora was one I had to work on um Asad is uh the theater geek that becomes mm -hmm. one of her good friends who I just I just love him and he he actually I didn't have to work on him a lot he just kind of came out fully formed and awesome and I was like I, I love this guy like every scene I wrote with him was so fun because he was just such a good, warm-hearted, hilarious guy. So he didn't change much. The person I could think of that changed the most actually in revision was Kenzie. She's kind of the mean girl. Mm -hmm. um, and in my early drafts, she was a pretty stereotypical mean girl, like for no reason, just me, you know, just mean to Piper, just queen bee mean. Um, and, and I didn't want her to be two dimensional like that. So I really spent a lot of time going back and fleshing out her so that she had her own backstory and her own trauma. So there's a scene at the end, which you know, um, where we, she's been in a car accident and we see a scar on her neck that she keeps hidden with her hair. Um, and, and to me, that's kind of the moment of, we all have these scars, even the people that we think are being total jerks. Maybe it's because they're dealing with their trauma in a bad way and they need to learn the right way to deal with trauma. But I, I really worked hard to make her, yeah, there's, I don't, you don't like her when you read the book because she's still not very nice. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you understand that she's also got scars and also has trauma. Um, and maybe she just hasn't found the right way to, to deal. Um, so I really worked hard on her. You humanized her, honestly. Like it, the struggle for me as a reader was like, I want to hate her because she is the mean girl, right? Yeah. I want to be, I, I want to categorize her as such. But then in your writing, you reveal that she's human and that she's carrying her own burden and healing also. You talked about the end. Oh, I'm glad, I'm glad you got that. Because I've heard her my, like, readers were like why is she so mean she's just mean for no reason so 
yeah, I worked hard on making her a real person. <laughs> so. I toyed with her. I'm like, I want to like you, but I don't know if I should like you. Like, but I definitely got her story. Um, one of the things you talked about in, in answering the last question was the end of the story. So dramatic. <laughs> Being on stage, the lights yeah. are on, the camera, the um, <laughs> phone lights are on. <laughs> It's, it's perfect. It's, it, you're at a heightened state of, of emotion as a reader as you're reading it. And then it ends. And I have to say to you that it didn't feel like I'm going to, sometimes I read a book and I'm like, oh, I'm going to miss these characters. And I, I, I don't want them to go away. But I, I didn't feel that tra let's sort of trauma with, with your characters. I was happy for them. I'm like, yay. I do want to know, like, did this happen? How was the singing? Like, what happens next? But I was, I was at a good place in ending the, in ending the story and saying, okay, this yeah. worked out well. This is good. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. So I did appreciate the end. Um, was that the ending that you initially planned on? Yeah, that had been the ending in my head from the beginning. And, it, and really that last chapter didn't change much through all the revisions. And I think I ended it there because I wanted to end it in a place where literally Ava is stepping into the light, right? She's yeah. owning her scars, people are seeing her scars, and she's okay with it. I knew there, there was no ending where things were better, right? There was no ending where she was unscarred, or like there was no ending that could tie it all up in a perfect bow, but I felt like this was as close as I could get to saying, look, she's gonna be okay. Yes. She's got yeah. scars, and she's gonna be okay. And that's, that's how I wanted to end it. Um, that with that feeling of, yeah, like she's got things ahead of her, but she's going to make it because she has this belief that she's so much more than these scars now. And that's, that's where I wanted to end it. Now, last year was my first year teaching high school. Um, I was an elementary school teacher, same, same subject matter, but in elementary. And scars were a big part of my learning of how to interact with my students and the stories that they were coming in with. Granted, most students that are coming from different countries have a story and background that sometimes is traumatic, not always, but they have stories that you, know, you, you wanna delve into, you wanna get to know them, wanna know what they are. But I had one particular student who revealed his scars to me and revealed the depth of what he was dealing with. Um, so in reading this book, I started thinking like, how do I, how do I present this to my students? How do I um, put this, as an option for them for reading. Do you have any thoughts of how I, as an ESL teacher, could integrate this reading? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So one thing that I have noticed is sometimes I'll tell teens what the book is about and their immediate reaction is like, oh, that sounds really heavy or that sounds really depressing. Oh, no. um, you know, cause it's like, oh, it's a bird survivor and it sounds dark and depressing. And there are definitely some dark moments in the book, which there would have to be. Um, but one thing I would tell students who are interested, who you're trying to get to read it, that it's actually, it's, there's some funny parts and it's about friendship and it's about finding your tribe um, and about living lifting each other up and flying higher together. It's not about burns. It's not about being a burn survivor. It's about surviving life and how we do that no matter what trauma we're recovering from. And honestly, what is being a teenager than like a constant series of recovering from trauma, right? It's just like new normal trauma, right. new normal trauma. So like, I think every teenager not, not, most people who read this book are not going to be burn survivors. Mm -hmm. um, it's awesome that you are, and I want to talk to you more about that too later. But, um, but most people aren't, but I think we're all recovering from something, especially as teenagers. We are constantly reconstructing our normal and trying to figure out who we are, and that's what this book is about. This book is about figuring out who we are and making a new normal for ourselves after a traumatic event, which we're all going through all the time, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's what I would tell students. Um, My students could definitely relate to the new normal and coming into a new school and trying to find their way. And there's so many scenes in the book that they are living through immediately, right? They're trying to, you know, make friends to walking down the hallway. Oh my goodness, that walk, that brought me back to my own yeah. high school experience because you're walking down the hallway and you swear everybody's looking at you. Right. Talking about you and some are, but that <laughs> pressure and just walking down the hallway. Well, well, that's the thing, like Ava, they literally are looking at her, but we all feel that way in high school. When you walk into the cafeteria and you don't know where your friends are and you're like, everyone is staring at me and hates me and think I'm so awkward and weird. Like that actually is happening to her, but we all think it's happening to us. When in reality, nobody cares at all about us. <laughs> but, but at that time, we think 
everyone sees how awkward and weird and stupid I am, right? Yes. And so that's something that she's living in a very literal way, but we all identify with that feeling. Oh yeah, yes. writing those scenes was like having to like revisit my own trauma from high school. <laughs> was high school good for you or was it like, were you, what sort of person were you in, the, in, in high school? High school was good for me. I was a journalism nerd, so like, there was the school newspaper and that was like my life. Like I was on deadline and you know, like getting the scoop. And so I was like big into the, into the newspaper. So I did a lot of that. So I was probably a huge dork, but I enjoyed it and I had dorky friends. So we were fine. Yeah. <laughs> so. You had your boss and you had your people, right? Yes, that's all that matters. <laughs> oh my goodness. So what are you working on now? Is there anything that we should be expecting from you? Yeah, so I actually turned in my um, draft to my editor like two weeks before everything shut down, which was kind of a blessing because once everything shut down, I have three kids and they were all home and um, my husband's an elementary school principal, so he was home and there was just no getting any work done after everything shut down. So I had turned that in and I'm still, um, we're, I'm waiting on notes for my revisions um, and that should be coming out. I think it's got bumped back a little because of everything publishing has been bumped back. Um, so I think it's coming out winter of 2022 and it's about a girl in high school with um, perfectionism anxiety, which is something that I've struggled with my whole life and she is trying to hold her family together um, while hiding this secret because she thinks it will be what destroys her family she thinks her loved ones can't handle this because she has this anxiety that makes her feel like if she's not perfect she's not worthy so that's what it's about it's about her story and yeah it's based closely on my own experience of being a total perfectionist and highly anxious. <laughs> so, and I think it's so funny because I've done school visits on Scars Like Wings. And when I tell kids what that book is about, I always have kids come up to me afterwards and be like, I really need that next book. I like, I really need that. So I just, boys, girls, teachers tell me, oh, I know 10 kids who need to read about that. I just think this anxiety issue is, is a big issue for kids right now. It's real. It's, it's definitely real. And I'm thinking, I think I can relate. Right. <laughs> I, think, I think I can. I, it gets so bad to the point where you don't end up not doing anything because right. you, you want it to be perfect. So nothing gets right. done. My sister is my, my, um, my person to encourage me. And she'll tell me, just submit something. Just, just, just hand it in. And once you send one thing in, everything will be okay. You'll be okay. It'll be fine. But then you still, yeah. I don't know, you know, so I'm looking forward to that. Do you have a title yet? Or right now it's called The Words We Keep, but who knows? Scars Like Wings went through five different titles, so who really? knows? Really? Like what? What, what were some of the other titles that you went to for that? So my working title on Scars Like Wings was, oh, I got to remember there were so many, was, I think it was Phoenix Rising. Okay. And everyone was like, that's way too dystopian. Like you can't do that. Um, and so then my agent, we changed it to Beauty for Ashes, which I still love. I think that's a beautiful title. They thought it was a little too adult. Um, it's biblical though, you know, right? Yeah. yeah. And then at one point it was just called Burned, mm -hmm. which was a little too on the nose. <laughs> um, and then we ended up with Scars Like Wings. And it, um, the, as you know, the title actually comes from a poem. Well, it's a song in the book and it ends with the phrase, she conquered her demons and wore her scars like wings. So that's where it came from. And in the book, it's a song by a band named Atticus. But in real life, it's a poem by a, an Instagram poet named Atticus who gave us permission to use it and he's been really generous and awesome so i went looking for the song and i <laughs> i have to find this but yeah then, yeah if you type in atticus in the lyric you'll find atticus's poetry which is beautiful so he's very cool we could keep going honestly um yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. and then actually i'm i you know i have so many pages of notes here and i'm sitting here thinking I'm so glad that Scars Like Wings ended up being the title because the other other names that you pitched, I'm sitting there going, no, it couldn't be. <laughs> it just changed the book for me. I would never, no. So I'm glad that it, it was. Yeah. Me too. And the two of you need to do shows all the time because <laughs> you guys just, you radiate off of each other. It was wonderful listening to you from behind the scenes. Oh, good. <laughs> good, good, good. We're going to go to the last prompt. Okay. Yes. We're doing another prompt. Okay. Well, we don't, we're not going to write on this one. We're going to give oh. this one for homework. So everybody who has writer's <laughs> notebooks at home, Esther. Yes. So the um, last prompt. Is this what I'm looking at on the screen or? Yes, it is. Yes. Okay. Awesome. So who are the people 
who have been there with you. And, and as we talk through the interview, we realize it's about people, right? People who need people. And who are the people that have been there with you through thick and thin as you move through life, building a thicker skin and learning to persevere? How have they helped you? And what do you have to say to them? I love this. <laughs> Can I add one thing here? Do you mind? Or do we? No, need please. Okay. Um, I just wanted to add, so when I started writing Scars Like Wings, I really thought it was just going to be a book about a girl with burn scars who learns to accept her scars and her skin, which is a part, which is definitely a big part of the book. Um, but the book changed for me um, when I was talking to Marius one day and I said, how does someone like you be so strong in the face of so much pain and tragedy? And his answer was really quick and really simple. And he said, every time I wanted to give up, someone came into my life. A nurse, a friend, a doctor, someone came in and helped me choose to stay. And there were many times Marius could have gone the other way. He, he was that sick. Um, and Ava as well. And so that really, when he said that, I was like, that's what this book is about. This book is about the people that come into our lives and help us choose to stay. Whatever staying looks like to us, um, they help us make that choice. And so it just goes with this question. And that's, that became the theme of the book because of what Maria said that day. And it really struck me and it's, it stayed with me. So I just wanted to add that in for this prompt. <laughs> Thank you. Thank it's you. funny. I, in the pages of the notes I had, the, the first quote you gave us, if you have a scar, then you know you survived, <laughs> you know, and then in the way that this book brings humanity uh, out to the forefront of, of giving everyone hope and providing a way forward, is, is just miraculously done. I mean, it's, it's talent, true talent. So thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Appreciate that. Uh, well, I was like, hmm, I got through this week without crying. And then you said, can I say one more thing? And I was <laughs> like, now I'm crying on screen. I had to just get that in there for you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, as we uh, told Tori last week, um, the writing project is often called also the eating project or the crying project. So <laughs> if you had a snack with us, we would be sure you're in our community for life. So make sure you get something to eat on your way out. <laughs> uh, this has been a great show. Uh, I love Aaron bringing you um, and your debut novel into mm -hmm. our fold and sharing it with so many um, high school and middle school teachers who I know are going to love it. Um, we cannot, teachers cannot do the work of um, helping kids see themselves as writers without exceptional books to share with young people. And so we want to thank you for putting this book out in the world. Thank you for being here with us today. It's an honor to have you. And Esther, you are an amazing interviewer. That was, you had yeah. great questions. It felt like a conversation. It just felt so like you two were sitting down for a cup of tea and having a great chat and we got to listen in and we're so thankful to you for representing the network of all the amazing teachers that we know and um, putting being here for us tonight. So thanks. Yeah, that's thanks. when I got emotional behind the scenes when I was just like watching the two of you pop questions back and forth and having a dialogue, teacher, writer, writer, teacher. And I was just like, this is so beautiful. And because when I, when I met Esther too, I was like, she's going to write a book one day. I, I just know she is. She's a voracious. Oh, thanks. She said, she said to me when I interviewed her for the writing project, she's just like, I need to connect back to the thing I love most, which is writing. And, and this is what this show's about. Well, if you ever need a beta reader. <laughs> <laughs> and be careful what you ask for. You know? <laughs> Aside from us having coffee, we, we, we might just do this. <laughs> Uh, listeners, thank you for staying with us today. If you're new to the writing project but would like to connect, you can follow us on Facebook and or join our Facebook community and or go to nwp.org where you can sign up for our newsletter right now to be informed about upcoming events and opportunities and read about work, our work and the work of everyone in the network to improve the teaching of writing. Um, Thanks for being here. Thank you again, Esther and Erin. Thank you, Brian, for making this what looked like a pipe dream to me at the beginning, a huge reality and a great part of my summer. Thanks so much. And it only cost you a dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, I didn't even, I missed that dinner, but thank yeah, you. You did. You, you had you, it. You, yeah. It was wonderful. Well, thank you. We'll see you. Thank ya. you, everyone. You're listening to NWP Radio, a production of the National Writing Project. NWP. W. Radio.